AH-1H helicopter. Also called the Huey, it was first deployed by the U.S. military in Vietnam back in 1963. Since then, it's become one of the world's most popular military helicopters. But after 54 years at the top of the aviation industry, the Huey is about to meet its match. This is the T-625. It's faster, goes further and packs more weapons. And it's designed and built in Turkey. It's a two-plus, uh, two-pilot plus 12-passenger helicopter designed for especially hot and high uh, environment. We are uh, hiring best engineers. Uh, we are using the best technology uh, to bring this helicopter into life. Its maiden flight is scheduled for next year. But the chopper is on display at this year's International Defence Industry Fair in Istanbul. And several countries want to add it to their war chest. In 2011, the Turkish government decided it would end its dependence on other countries to meet its defence needs, instead choosing to become self-sufficient by 2023. The sector's exports have doubled since then, and products like the T-625 helicopter and accompanying weapon systems are expected to launch overseas sales even higher. <laughs> New weapons include the Bozdoğan and the Gokdoğan missiles. Inaugurated by Prime Minister Bin Ali Yildirim, these short-range missiles can be launched from fighter jets, choppers or land-based systems all of which are also being built in Turkey. Traditionally, Turkey used to sell small firearms. Now that we are developing advanced weapon system, we can rise our exports significantly because buyers will be looking at getting entire solutions as well as maintenance contracts from Turkish suppliers. Such contracts are already coming in, with the UK signing a deal in January for several fighter jets. Turkey is also in the final stage of talks with Saudi Arabia on the sale of planes, missiles and other weapons. With a growing arsenal and sizable deals, Turkey's defence industry has billions of dollars in its crosshairs. Mubin Nasir, TRT World, Istanbul. Well, joining me from Washington DC is the defence analyst and author, Ivan Elland. Uh, Ivan, thank you so much for joining us on Money Talks this evening. I want to talk about the Serbian and Turkish uh, defence industries. Uh, let's start by asking you, what, it, what does it take to make a good defence arms brand? Well, I think uh, you have to have battle-tested weapons. Any country can build weapons, uh, but uh, the arms exporters always like to have their weapons uh, you know, involved in conflicts. And, of course, a lot of con uh, weapons have been uh, bleeding over into the Syrian uh, conflict among the opposition groups to uh, Bashar al-Assad. So does that mean, for example, the, uh, the Tomahawk missiles that were used by the United States, when we see those in use in Syria or other uh, theatres of war, those are the best advertisements for the weaponry? Yeah, I think, of course, if they have to work, uh, if the system doesn't work, then you have a big problem. Uh, like the North Korean missiles don't seem to be working very well. Uh, but, uh, yes, that's a good, good selling point. Uh, arms buyers in various countries watch TV and they watch wars very closely because a lot of times you can run weapon systems off, uh, off an assembly line and uh, they'll either be designed poorly or the, the environmental conditions in which they're used will make the system not work very well. Uh, so they have to be battle tested in an operational war. Uh, you know, if you go back in history, the AK-47 was a, a, a very simple weapon compared to the U.S. Uh, M16A1. Uh, yet uh, it, was it was better because it was easily maintained on the battlefield and that sort of thing. And the, the other, uh, the U.S. weapon was too complex. And that's where I think Turkey and Serbia have a market niche is a lot yes. of we U.S. weapons are too expensive and uh, they're too complex for a lot of uh, developing countries yeah. to uh, operate. I wanted to ask you about that because the, the permanent five on the U.N. Security Council, uh, China, the United States, uh, Russia, France and Britain, they seem to also dominate the, the arms industry. So when you're looking at, at the arms industry, can you compare it to, say, to, the, you know, to the, the car market, for example? If you can't afford the Rolls Royces and the Mercedes, but you can afford, say, the Volkswagens or the, the Vauxhalls, you have to go to Serbia. So there's a, a different market there. 
Yeah, and I think there are many uh, middle-range arms producers uh, who are very good. Serbia has a good reputation. They've been, uh, you know, ever since Tito uh, ran Yugoslavia, they have been uh, had a good reputation for arms sales. The Czechs uh, uh, do also do, and uh, you know, these countries uh, can have a have a uh, an export role. Now, whether that's good for their domestic economies is a number is another thing. And you know, the quest for foreign currency is sometimes illusory because perhaps they should be diverting some of these uh, ar arms production into civilian uh, production for their own people. However, uh, you know, if you have a military and you have to buy weapons for it, you can get economies of scale and lower your own costs by exporting. So, so there's an incentive for a lot of countries to export. Ivan Allen, thank you so much for that insight into the defense industry. Not always a transparent one. Thank you.